The Outsiders started as an idea thought up by a 16-year-old high school student, and it is now the stuff of legend. S.C. E. Hinton's novel about social class and teenage despair was a hit with young audiences as soon as it was published, and in the 50 years since its debut, its popularity has not only persevered throughout different generations, but it has even increased, because its fictional tale about gangs and rumbles offers timeless insight into the parasitic bond between violence and vulnerability. Violence is an integral part of The Outsiders. Without violence, the rivalry between the Greasers and the Socias would have very few stakes. The characters regularly get involved in one-on-one -on -one fights, and every now and then there's a big fight called a rumble. Violence is how these characters get to unleash their frustrations with the state of their lives, whether it's the Greasers fighting back against a world that feels like it's caving in on them and fighting back to survive, or the Socias fighting because they'd like to feel something more than the complacency that settled into their lives. Violence is how they talk about their feelings when words just aren't enough. In a way, violence is used as a vehicle for the vulnerability these characters either can't or refuse to allow themselves to show. And when there's a threat around every corner, whether they're walking down the street or sitting in their homes, letting their guards down isn't always an option. The Outsiders serves as a study on young masculinity, violence, and vulnerability. How these themes are explored with each character varies, but perhaps my favorite observations come with the characters of Ponyboy, Johnny, and Dallas. There are many words you could use to describe the character Ponyboy Curtis. Observant, quiet, pensive, but the one I frequently use is sensitive. No character in The Outsiders is as emotional as Ponyboy. He cries looking at sunsets, he cries at the idea of ever falling in love, he cries when he hurts and when he heals. He's so in touch with his emotions that everything he feels becomes all-consuming and inescapable. It's partly because he's the youngest of the group, only having turned 14 a short while before the novel begins, but it's also because he's a cancer. That's true, look it up. In the first chapter of the book, Ponyboy is jumped by a group of socias. They pull a blade out on him, cut him on the neck, and by the time the socias are chased away, he's in tears. He's ashamed of the tears he's shed because, as he puts it, crying isn't tough. He notes that the only time it seemed appropriate for someone to cry after a fight was when they all found Johnny, the group's beloved pet, crying after he was jumped by a group of socias. I drew a quivering breath and quit crying. You just don't cry in front of Derry. Not unless you're hurt like Johnny had been that day we found him in the vacant lot. Compared to Johnny, I wasn't hurt at all. For Ponyboy, crying isn't necessarily tough, but he sees a point where crying may be necessary, like when someone is beaten beyond their breaking point. Whereas for others, crying isn't an option at all. It's not even a last resort. Even with that insight, Ponyboy does still spend a great deal of the novel lamenting his intense emotions. It's not cool to cry. There are only a few times when it's appropriate. His journey early on in the book is the journey of a young man trying hard to harden the parts of himself that the world deems to be too weak. He separates himself often from his two older brothers, Derry and Soda Pop, being that he's just too different from either of them to share any type of relation, where his brothers are practical, grounded in reality, and seemingly unshakable in the realm of emotional vulnerability, Ponyboy is a dreamer, often swooning over the magical aspects of life, like the beauty of art or sunset. But even when Ponyboy tries to be stoic and unshakable, he can't help but to feel things and to feel them deeply, which is why his bond with Johnny Cade is so strong. Of the entire group, Johnny and Ponyboy are the youngest. In a way, they serve as mirrors for one another. Ponyboy doesn't see himself fitting in much with anyone else. He can't go to the movies with Dairy or Soda or 2-Bit. He couldn't talk about the sunset with any of them, but he can show Johnny the sunset, and in turn, Johnny can show Ponyboy a part of the world that hadn't occurred to him before. With each other, they can see the world in a way that's less black and white and more varying hues of gray. They both watch the world around them more than they like to engage with it, keeping quiet on the outskirts as they try to understand life and, more often than not, come up short. Johnny isn't vulnerable with everyone else in the group, not unless the situation is dire, but he can cry comfortably in Ponyboy's presence, knowing that Pony will understand where he's coming from. Besides, Johnny can't let his guard down enough to be vulnerable with just anyone, not when he's coming from such an abusive home life, not when he's walking around with a target on his back, not when people look for ways to break him just for fun. For Johnny, it seems the best way to survive is to be invisible, but even that weighs on him to the point that he thinks he may prefer being hurt. I think I like it better when the old man said to me, be 
least he knows I'm there. For Dallas, on the other hand, being vulnerable is just as good as being dead. You show people a weakness of any kind and they'll be quick to use it against you before you can understand what you've done. For Dallas, it's a dog-eat-dog, -dog, every man for himself kind of world. Except, not entirely. Dallas may have these rules for himself, rules about being tough and not showing weakness, but when he sees that same wide-eyed tenderness in Johnny, his first instinct is not to destroy it, but to protect it. When Johnny and Ponyboy come to Dallas for help after Johnny kills Bob, Dallas's mission is to keep them out of jail and out of trouble. He sends them to Wendricksville, to an abandoned church on a hilltop where they can hide out until the heat cools down. When he visits them two weeks later and Johnny expresses a desire to turn himself in, Dallas, for the first time ever, displays more emotions than just anger and stoicism. He's desperate and begging for Johnny not to turn himself in. Why? It'd be the right thing to do, no? not to Dallas. Johnny turning himself in means jail time, and jail time means that Johnny's softness will be hardened and his good nature will vanish. Dallas understands that being tough and as emotionless and as unbothered as possible gives him more of a fight against life's many beatdowns, but he doesn't want that for Johnny or Ponyboy because being like him, completely unable to be vulnerable, unable to deal with his emotions, means living life like a ticking time bomb ready to blow any second. Anger is frequently shown to be one of the few emotions none of the characters have trouble expressing, whether it's Dallas's show of anger when he's repeatedly rejected by Cherry Valance at the movie theater, or Derry's anger toward Pony which kickstarts the entire plot. And more often than not, these feelings of anger are expressed through violence, fighting, rumbles, yelling, because anything more complex than that, or softer than that, is not the way to be tough or masculine. Where this dichotomy is best demonstrated is with Johnny's death scene. The respective reactions from Ponyboy and Dallas further illustrate the dangerous use of violence as an emotion. After Johnny takes his last breath, Pony's reaction is to cry, and it's easy for him because the one thing he can't do is bottle up his emotions. But for Dallas, there is an immediate struggle. He's in disbelief, and that disbelief turns into anger. So this is what you get, huh? This is what you get for helping people. Punk. The question he poses not only refers to Johnny's heroic act before dying, but refers to Johnny's general good-hearted nature, that softness, that kindness. What good, asks Dallas, does it get anyone? It echoes what he said before. Dallas struggles to mourn, and the way the role is performed by Matt Dillon in the film adaptation, he even struggles to cry, and it's fascinating to watch the decisions he makes as an actor. I love watching this final act with Dallas simply because of how Dillon plays it. Everything in him is telling him to just cry, to let it out, but he can't or won't allow himself to do it, not completely. So he resorts to the only other way he knows how to express emotion, which is through violence. Dallas's final actions following Johnny's death both show his use of violence as a vehicle for vulnerability and serves as an attempt on his part to prove to himself and to Johnny that if you're tough, if you're hardened, the world won't hurt you because it can't. No one can. Dallas's inability to deal with Johnny's death is what causes him to explode. The combination of bottling his emotions for a lifetime and the death of an innocent person whom he loved dearly sets off the bomb that was done ticking. Pony says it best here. Dally's gone. He couldn't take it, he's gonna blow. Before he dies, Johnny has the nurse write a letter to Pony where he implores him to continue seeing the beautiful things in life, to keep looking at sunsets. His last words are an extension of that with the imploration to stay gold, taking on a shorthand of his last letter. Stay gold doesn't mean to just stay youthful, it means to stay tender, to continue being the kind of person who feels deeply, who admires sunsets, who enjoys the magic of the world. More importantly, Johnny asks Pony to show Dallas a sunset, to show him how to be vulnerable. I want you to ask Dally to look at one. I don't think he's ever seen a sunset. There's still lots of good in the world. Tell Dally I don't think he knows. It's kind of funny. When Dallas is trying to explain to Johnny why turning himself in would be disastrous, Johnny's ears are closed dead. 
He's just learned that in the two weeks he's been gone, his parents haven't asked about him once, and nothing else matters. I guess my folks are worried about hey, me. Hey, man, already. the boys are worried. Did you know that Two-Bit wanted to go to Texas to hunt for you? Yeah, I asked if my parents asked about me. No, they didn't ask about you. So what? You think my old man gives a hang if I'm uh, dead in a car wreck or drunk or in jail or something? He doesn't care. But that doesn't bother me none. But if Johnny's last letter is any indication, by the time he dies, he does understand what Dallas was trying to protect him from, a response by trying to protect Pony from the same thing, even trying to undo the damage it's done to Dallas. After Johnny's attack at the hands of the Socius, fear consumes him. He's jumpy, nervous, and starts carrying a blade to protect himself. In the end, it's his fear that leads to Bob's death. All that pent-up anger, frustration, and terror. Johnny lives in a world where he's taught by many to suppress his emotions, and that becomes clear when he tells Pony that he hadn't really thought about sunsets until it was pointed out to him. Even Johnny struggles with his emotions, often hiding his unhappiness with an unreadable mask. Around the other greasers, he shrouds himself with the weapon of silence, but only lets his guard down around Pony and Dallas. After Johnny kills Bob in self-defense, he and Pony run to Dallas for help. I love the moment they all share as Dallas advises them on what to do, because we see the vast differences in how each of them handle their emotions. Pony and Johnny show themselves to be the young children that they are, both in tears with Johnny barely holding them back and even being on the brink of sucking his thumb. But Dallas remains unshakable. He's been crystallized to the point that not even murder can shake him. But what does get a rise out of him is the idea of Johnny losing his vulnerability. And then much later, when Johnny dies, and he simply can't make sense of it. You can see him many times wanting to cry, but also trying to fight his sorrows back with anger and hostility. Of course, he can't prove that being tough like him leads to survival, and it's hard not to consider that deep down, he might have already known that. Dallas doesn't believe that being tough gets you farther in life. If he did, he wouldn't fight so hard to protect Johnny from sharing his fate. Yeah, life had hardened Dallas beyond recognition, but he still had one soft spot, and that soft spot was Johnny. You don't know what a few months of jail can do to you, man. You get mean in jail. I just don't want to see that happen to you like it happened to me, man. You understand? And once he was gone, there was no point to anything else. Dally had reached the circle of light under the street lamp, and skidding to a halt, he turned and jerked a black object from his waistband. Dally raised the gun and I thought, you blasted fool. They don't know you're only bluffing. And even as the policeman's gun spit fire into the night, I knew that was what Dally wanted. Between Johnny's crime and Dallas's death, S.E. Hinton showcased the environments that create this young, toxic masculinity where young men are told to suppress emotion, to hide who they are, to always be tough. It's a recipe for disaster, or more correctly, a recipe for tragedy. When that cycle of numbness and violence is around you, it's hard to escape it unscathed. Having witnessed the deaths of Johnny and Dallas, and even with the insight he has, Pony still finds himself becoming numb. Long after Dallas and Johnny are gone, Pony is approached by some socius who accuse him of killing Bob. And he's surprised when at their appearance, he feels nothing. Not fear, not anger, nothing. I was sitting on the fender of Steve's car, smoking and drinking a Pepsi while he and Tubit were inside talking to some girls. When a car drove up and three socius got out, I just sat there and looked at them and took another swallow of the Pepsi. I wasn't scared. It was the oddest feeling in the world. I didn't feel anything. Scared, mad, or anything. Just zero. Pony breaks off a bottle and holds it by the neck, threatening the socius with it. And when Two-Bit sees this, he is shaken. Pony boy, listen, don't get tough. You're not like the rest of us and don't try to be. Pony's survival may be incidental, but it also just might be an example. When Johnny dies, Pony is broken. Johnny was his best friend, his confidant, someone he could share everything with. But even he knows how to get through such a devastating loss. And even he can tell 
that Dallas doesn't. The Outsiders is a reflection of discontented youth, and that is the reason it has stood the test of time for so long. As long as the world tells young men not to feel things too deeply, as long as the world continues to dismiss the disillusionment of the youth, the Outsiders will, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, remain relevant. But at the very least, it's a story that many can see themselves in. I could picture hundreds and hundreds of boys living on the wrong sides of cities, boys with black eyes who jumped at their own shadows. Hundreds of boys who maybe watched sunsets and looked at stars and ached for something better. I could see boys going down under streetlights because they were mean and tough and hated the world. And it was too late to tell them that there was still good in it. And they wouldn't believe you if you did. <laughs>